People are just loving their antiques and vintage these days. It is so exciting to see what's happening in the marketplace. Let's talk a little bit about what happened in my marketplace on eBay at auctions in our last round of eBay sales because we sold out and I think there's some good tips for some reseller folks in here and a lot of fun for collectors to see where things are going and why. The first item that sold was the first item that we listed, which is this cool Griswold plet pan. And a plet pan is what you make crepes in. You can see the little indentations there. This came fresh out of an estate sale. I didn't do anything to it at all. I think one tip I can share with you is that you don't necessarily need to make everything perfect. If I had scrubbed and cleaned and seasoned this, would I have gotten a little more money? I'm not sure that I would have, but I would have done a whole lot more work. So I think sometimes if you're honest about the representation and you say, look, this is the way I found it, you will actually do just as well. And this sold for $49, buy it now. And I was just really tickled. It went to a friend of ours in Georgia who I really enjoy. This is the small logo. This is the last of the logos that they did from the 1930s to the 1950s. And it's just really cool. Now, another tip I can give you is when you see a piece of Griswold, look for this little mark, the circle with the cross in it. Because even if it doesn't say Griswold, like their mailboxes will have that on it. Some of their other cast iron pieces will have just that symbol without actually saying Griswold. So you can pick up some sleepers out there that way. Overall, the condition was good. It has the model number on it, number 34. Anyways, a nice piece, and I hope she's enjoying her crepes. This went to the same person, actually, because we do combine shipping. And yes, I know a big, heavy iron frying pan and a paper map, but you know what? We put the paper in cardboard. They got there just fine, and this sold for $65. Buy it now. This is a good map. The Disney maps are popular because they changed over the years. Here it is looking a little more folded because these were folded. That's how you bought them, because you were supposed to use them at the park. And then people would take them home and put them up as a poster. And this one had been pinned. You can see the little pinholes in the corners here. We'll show you that. But that didn't seem to matter too much because it wasn't messing up the graphics. That's the important thing. And the graphics are great. They're talking about the spaceport and how they're in, under construction. And so that tells us that this was done in the late 60s. Another thing that tells us the date is that over here we have Bear Country. This is the beginning of the Country Bear Jamboree, but the Country Bear Jamboree became its own thing later. It was in the Disneyland Hotel area first, but then it got to be its own attraction in the park for many, many years. This was our biggest sale of the round, and I am so glad that the person who I was helping with these helped me identify them correctly as Mazer. Mazer was a really good company. These were actually designed by Boucher when he worked for them, and they were in great shape. And no, they are not marked. I had someone send me an email saying, are they marked? Well, they're not. Uh, not all of the Mazer pieces were marked. In fact, a lot of them were not. So you have to know what you're looking for. But this absolutely was Mazer, the Trudy Fruity. They were a company that made things that were a little better quality than their price point. They were a medium price point, but they used really good textured stones, all Swarovski crystal. This is before the Second World War. So good stuff. And that went out to Portland, Oregon. This made me really happy. I had a friend who has several of these and we sold three at a show and this was the last one but I kept this one for eBay because it was the one that is actually the hardest to find and this went to another friend of ours a viewer who I really enjoy who loves dog stuff and specifically loves Scotty stuff and here's the Scotty straining at his leash because he sees all of these wonderful blondes this is French this is by Boris O'Klein Boris may not sound like a French name, but he was actually originally from Russia and then moved to France. And this is just a wonderful piece. It was in really good shape. It's one of the harder ones in the series to find, and it went for $150 also on a buy it now. When I do these sales, I try to do some things on buy it now if I'm not traveling and I'm able to ship the things right away because I figure that 
you know, this is done as a benefit to our level two and three members. They are the ones who pay extra membership every month. And so they get early access to these videos. And I want them to have the chance to buy some of the things right away since they contribute to the channel in that manner. And if you're not a member and you're seeing this after the fact, well, you're welcome to look under the dash line in the description of any video and click the membership link and it will tell you all about memberships and how you can do that. This did very well. It's a good piece of real Vaseline glass. This is from about 1905. This was Jefferson's Astro Pattern. And Jefferson Glass was a good company. Here's what it looks like without the black light on it. And when they made these back in 1905, they just knew it made a really happy bright yellow color when they put the uranium oxide in. This is not that long after Madame Curie is doing her experiments with radium and they're starting to realize that there's something in this stuff. And thankfully it's inert when it's cold, but when they were making it hot, well, it was very bad for the glass blowers. So by this time they had figured out that they better only make pressed pieces. So this is a piece of EAPG, which is early American pattern glass. And Jefferson only made things for five or seven years. Then, then they sold off the molds and they went into the brand new lighting business. They started making headlights for cars. They started making street lights because electrification was coming and cars were coming and they made a lot of money doing that when they moved from Ohio to West Virginia. But this is an early piece for them. It's a great pattern too. And I think that's why, plus thankfully, even with my puny little black light, I was able to get a very nice big bright picture of it so people knew how cool it was. It got 39 bids and that's a lot. So uh, $120.50. I thought that was a very good finish, and I'm glad that the people responded to it so well. These went for $52. This is about the right price for these. These are Sanborns, and I, it was interesting because I was on my way to Mexico City when I dropped these listings, and the person who bought this after 20 bids ended up with it for $52. Now, I started it really low because I figured, well, let's let people bid it up to what it's worth, and that's exactly what happened. It has the Almark Sanborns when I went to Mexico City, is a very popular place to go. It, it started as a pharmacy, but now it's a variety store. They have restaurants in them. Uh, the big one that is in a 250-year-old mansion in downtown Mexico City is just amazing. It was their first big location, and it has a cocktail bar and two restaurants, and it's just a phenomenal place. So I got to actually see where these sold. Sanborn still sells silver and silver plate, but they don't sell anything that looks like this these days. So that's part of the reason they're so popular. They had, uh, they were actually the first to hire an American designer to do the silversmithing. And they did that in the 1920s before William Spratling ended up in Mexico. So a little bit of silver trivia there. Mexican silver is really, really nice. Actually, a lot of things in Mexico are really nice. I just did a video from Mexico City uh, that came out, and I will have another one coming soon. And if you haven't watched it, don't let the thumbnail fool you. It's not a travelogue. It is about antiques in Mexico City, and the places that we went and the things we saw were phenomenal, and many wonderful antiques that you just never see anymore. So I think you'll enjoy it. I really enjoyed seeing this go to where it was supposed to go. It went for $159.05. That five cents got it. So, you know, you eBay bidders, make sure if you, uh, you want to snipe something at the last minute, that little extra... Bump might be the thing that gets you the piece. It went on 12 bids, and it went to a woman in Massachusetts very close to where this was made. This was a roadside pottery that made really cool modernist stuff, very vibrant. I mean, look at that glaze, and it is just really something special. And here's the mark on the back, Joby Pottery. They finally closed after 50 years of production, and now a woman has resurrected the name, and the pottery is going again, but they make different things. And so that's why these pieces are hard to find. And for people in the know in the Northeast, this is a very collectible piece, and you can tell by the price it fetched. This is another pottery company that I thought was really neat. This is 
Be uh, Bella vase, and these were from the 1980s. And look at that Memphis style. It glows. It's such a yellow, yellow color. It is just really fun. I... I thought the shape was neat. I have another one that's blue gray and it's a little more traditional shape, uh, but the yellow just really popped and it popped for $44, which is about what this should sell for. So I was pleased that it found its level. This didn't sell until the very last minute and then it got five bids. So one thing to know if you're doing eBay auctions and people say, well, why do you do the auctions? You could get more perhaps if you went fixed price. Well, I have to say, first of all, I wouldn't have known to price the Joby piece at $159. I wouldn't have known to price the Jefferson piece at $120. So the auctions do work in your favor sometimes. This piece sold for about what it should have if I had put it out there. And $35 on five bids I thought was just fine, but it didn't get a single bid until about an hour left in the listing. So sometimes just being patient is the important thing. And, you know, price it. If you're starting it at auction, price it at the minimum that you're willing to accept for the piece. Don't necessarily think you have to go for the gusto every time. I have this at $19.99. I knew it was worth more. I figured if worse came to worse and it went for $19.99, I could live with that because of what I had into it. And then it turned out that it found its level and went to the price it should have. The Martz company, the Martzes were a couple who ended up working in the mother-in-law's factory where they made lamps and Mart's lamps are very collectible now too. There's our signature there. And if it looks a lot like Glidden pottery, well, that's because the Bartzes went to the Alfred school in New York at the same time that Glidden did. And so they all had influence on each other. I really like the waves. This is a piece from about 1960. Ava Zeisel. This went to another viewer, and uh, she's somebody I really enjoy, and I don't know whether she had the sauce boat to go with this, but I wanted to make a point. There's another piece of dinnerware that we'll show, too, that's sold. People pass stuff like this up a lot these days because they've heard older dealers talk about how, oh, nobody wants china and dinnerware anymore. Well, you know what? Harlequin pattern by Ava Zeisel is an exception to that. The modernist patterns from the 50s still sell. Look at that great shape. Ava Zeisel was so far ahead of her time. And the Harlequin pattern is really fun. I mean, do you see a Harlequin in that? Well, I see a bunch of squiggles and angles and great colors, and I just thought it was really neat. And so did the purchaser. And so it went for 1950. And, you know, this is the kind of thing you might see for 99 cents at a thrift store near you because they don't necessarily know and because the perception is that dinnerware isn't selling. Well, guess what? It might not be selling for giant prices that it used to, but if you get the right pattern and the right piece, there's still money to be made. So resellers, take note. This piece is really neat. This is Fulper. Fulper is a great old pottery. They ended up being purchased by Stangle, and eventually they just were another place for Stangle to make its dinnerware. But back in the arts and crafts era, around 1910, when this piece was made, they did a lot of really cool drip glazes. Look at the way it all runs together. This is a thing that we think of later with companies like Treasure Craft, where they did these flowing glazes. But Fulper came up with this many, many years before. And so they get a lot of credit for that. Their shapes tended to be fairly simple. It was all about the glaze. This has the wisteria, and I know that the spelling may seem odd, but the wisteria in their catalog was often spelled this way, and that's why I spelled it this way in the listing. And the collectors knew because 11 bids came through and it went for $92. Somebody contacted me right when the listing had been up for maybe a day or two and said, would you please do a buy it now? I'll give you $25 for it. So I changed the listing to a buy it now and by darn, they did not buy it. <laughs> so you know what? Um, when people contact you through eBay and they seem really hot for something, there is no guarantee. So you have to decide what you want to do.
It didn't really matter. It went for $17.50 on three bids. It was an unusual piece because it's just the usual orange tree by Fenton, but this is towards the end of Carnival Glass when they start selling it as souvenirs and to carnivals. That's why it got the name, because they couldn't find buyers for it anymore because the taste had changed. So this is late in the production of this, and it's from a little place on a bay in Nova Scotia that is a tourist destination at the very southeast or southwest end of Nova Scotia, Doctor's Cove. And I had a couple of people from that area very excited that we put something on that was from Canada. And I really enjoy showing things from all over North America. So we got Canada, Mexico, and the United States in on this particular bunch of stuff. And Europe as well, because the next piece that we show here is RS Prussia. And this is a really, really fun pattern. This is Clovers and Roses. There's your clovers and the roses or the impressed pattern. RS Prussia is beautiful stuff. They just made the neatest, most beautiful porcelain. It's very fine. It's almost translucent. You can kind of see that in the picture here where there's a little bit of a glow from the light coming through in the back. It is wonderfully decorated. There's transfer of the roses, but then there's also hand painting. The molds are very, very elaborate, which is part of the big appeal. This is another thing that people avoid because they have heard older dealers say, well, it just doesn't sell anymore. Well, granted, this piece used to sell for twice the price that we got, but we got $31, and I'll tell you, we didn't pay anywhere close to $31 for it because nobody is looking at this stuff anymore. So if you're a collector and you like pretty things, you should be looking at this stuff. And if you're a reseller and you like selling pretty things, you should be looking at this stuff. The one thing to be careful about are the reproductions that they did in the 1990s that really killed the market, which is why it fell. One viewer of mine told me an interesting thing, and that is that the original pieces, the word Prussia has a period after it, and the reproduction marks typically do not. So that's a good clue right there. This was really fun to sell. It's a lot of miniatures, and it's just all sorts of things. I think there's some really cute stuff in here. You've got a couple of generations here. The whisk is newer. John Lennon is 1960s. But then you have a clock charm from probably the 1920s or 30s. You have this little, uh, it's like a shovel, this little piece here. And this is quite old with the curly cues. You've got Prince Albert as a charm there. You have a little tiny knife. So this is a multi-generational collection of miniatures. And I just thought that was really sweet. And I decided to price them all together instead of trying to price them out individually because it's just a lot of little pieces. And I thought somebody who likes miniatures is going to like all this stuff. And there were 10 bids. And it went for $27, which, you know, it's a good deal for the person who got it at two or $2 and 50 cents a piece. And a few of them, yes, they could sell more. The Prince Albert probably is worth $6. John Lennon's probably worth six to $8. But, you know, sometimes it is better to move a bunch of small things that might get lost. So I just wanted this to all go to one person who had had fun with it. And they did. These were nice. Cremants made 14 karat gold that was solid gold at one time and then later on they went to gold overlay which is basically a plating and that's what these are and so this has the original box including the little folio in the bottom of how to care for your fine quality jewelry but they're screw backs now i had someone recently tell me they prefer screw backs to clips it all depends on your earlobes and how they feel to you but in this case I figured the screwbacks might hold the price down, and I think it did a little bit. $21 for this set. You know, they're nice opals. The opals are the main attraction. They're not huge. I thought that was a decent price for what it was, and Kremitz was a very good maker of a lot of different things, and so it was nice to share the story of them. This surprised me. This went for more money than I thought it would. This is Blondie A to Z, and this was a World War II piece in reasonable condition, but the important part is the graphics were really interesting inside and it was absolutely about 
the war. This came out in 1945, and a lot of people do not realize that comic characters were used for war propaganda and the promotion of the American and allied cause in the Second World War. But of course, it was very important to have everybody together on the home front, including kids. And they told some pretty interesting things like there might be a blackout, make sure you put every light out, stay in your house, and don't be afraid. And this is important, don't phone in a raid. Interesting. I did not realize that during the blackouts that you had to be silent and not use the phone either. They did some pretty crazy things in World War II. The top of the Boeing plant in Seattle, they built an entire neighborhood of fake houses on top of the roof so that it would not look like an industrial plant from the air. This went for $70 on 10 bits. It is a hard piece to find. This was from my mother's collection and she had gotten it at a thrift store. So there you go, folks. You can find things at thrift stores and do well with them. Now here is the other piece of dinnerware. This was a very nice gravy boat in the Rosenthal Moss Rose pattern. It's probably the most famous pattern they made, but this was on the rather plain Aida shape that they made, and they called it Petal Lane. This is in the 1950s. This is a fast stand, uh, meaning that the stand is attached. Rosenthal made beautiful things. The Moss Rose is one of their most popular patterns. This would sell for more if it was in a fancier shape. The Pompadour pattern, this would go for probably twice or three times as much. But the truth is, if you think about shipping, the person who bought this actually paid about $23, $24 for it. And that's about what this should go for. If I hadn't been in Florida where the shipping was cheaper, I probably would have gotten a little more money for it. But again, the point is, I didn't pay a lot of money for it. We had a wonderful set at an estate sale, and we couldn't find buyers for it. And I see it selling online. I see Replacements Limited selling. Again, it seems like dealers and resellers are not thinking about this sort of thing because they're just convinced that it can't sell. So I wanted to show that, yes, indeed, it can. And if you saw this piece for 99 cents at a thrift store and you're a reseller, that's a pretty good markup. If you are a collector, well, you might actually really enjoy collecting this while it's inexpensive because we are seeing that for the better patterns and the better makers, and Rosenthal is definitely considered one of the premier China makers in Europe, they're still in business. They do a lot of modernist designs and a studio line with a lot of designers now. But their traditional pieces are starting to sell again. So that's something to be aware. This is another book from my mother's collection. This was a little tiny book called Mr. Pinkerton Passage for One by David Frome. David Frome was actually a pseudonym, and she was also known as Leslie Ford, and my mother collected a lot of her mysteries. She went to the University of Washington, my alma mater. Her real name was Zenith. She went, Zenith went to England, met a guy, got married. His first name, I believe, was Ford. She decided to take Leslie Ford as her pseudonym for her American-based novels, but for these pieces that were based on fictitious characters she made based on her time in England, she decided to be David Frome. And so she worked under a couple of pseudonyms and ended up being very, very popular. Now, this little book was by a company called the, uh, it's Royce Publishers, and they were called Quick Readers. This is the Second World War again, when people didn't really have time to necessarily read a whole book and also materials for printing books were in short supply. And so they were inexpensive, they were a fast read, and they also were not of great quality. So the condition is not terrific on this because the paper they used was thin, the staples, you can see a little rust, there was a little hole in the margin, but it still sold because they're hard to find. And it was at least an intact reading copy. And it went for eleven fifty on three bids to another one of our favorite uh, viewers. I would say probably a third of what sold this month went to viewers. Somebody asked me how much goes to viewers, and I have to admit there is an advantage to having a YouTube channel and having viewers who follow and are interested in the kinds of things that you bring. But if you work on building a market, you can build a market however you're doing that. Real world shows, online, if you're specializing in something, collector groups, I mean, there's all sorts of ways to build a market in this business. So just keep plugging away at it if you're a reseller. 
you'll get there. The same person got both of these, which was interesting because the book went in a little flat package and then I had to find a box that um, had originally been from a gun seller that was long enough for the umbrella to go. It sold for $26 on five bids. These Aramis umbrellas from the 1980s, they can sell. And this one has the original tag, playing to win. And it's got the dice in the handle and that's the big appeal. And there it is on the other side there. And I was just, I thought this was something fun and something different. And yes, it was a little hard to ship and the shipping ended up being a lot of the cost. Again, if I was in the middle of the country instead of Florida, when I listed this particular piece, well, the total that the customer paid was $46, actually 47 with shipping. And so, you know, I might have gotten a bigger portion of that as a seller. So certain things you do have to pay attention to where you're shipping from as far as does it make sense to do little things, big things. Uh, well, I will have another video coming out soon with our next flight of eBay items and you'll see a combination of big and little things again. And I'll be traveling cross country with them. So uh, we will be shipping from the other corner of the country. This was another one that didn't really take off at first. And I was a little concerned because it was selling at about the price of the reproductions that Restoration Hardware made. And I went to great lengths in my video to talk about why this wasn't a reproduction, which I can show you here. The casting is deep. There's patina in the back. You can see that it's worn from where it was handled. You can see a little bit of rust on the shank. And those were the clues, especially right there. See the wear. That is something you get from years of turning the knob. The restoration hardware pieces that were made 20 years ago are not going to have that level of wear. But eventually the market clued into this. And at the last day or so, the price really shot up to what it should have. $141 on 36 bids. It did go to somebody in New York. So happy school day memories. And it was just exciting to see how it went. And I thought it was a really fun and interesting piece. So that is our wrap up of what happened on eBay auctions. And I thank all of you who bid. I thank all of you who participated. I thank all of you watching this video. Please do click to uh, thumbs up to like this video. And if you're not a subscriber to the channel, please consider becoming one because then you can click the bell to be notified of future videos. And also, if you are not a member of the channel, well, if you become a level two or three member, you can see our next eBay listing early because members get early access. So uh, thank you so much to everybody and we'll see you again soon. If you enjoyed this video, check out this one. Also click thumbs up to like this video and check the description for information about our Patreon, our memberships. We've got a lot of different levels with different perks and bonus videos and early content. Also, please do check out our website, theantiquenomad.com for appraisal help. And we'll see you again for more adventures in the antique and vintage community soon. Bye for now.